What's going on everybody and welcome back to Comic Breakdown. Now in this video we're going to be covering everything that is leading up to the Fall of X and the Hellfire Gala of 2023. So in putting this video together I decided to grab a little bit of everything that's going on just so you can grasp the idea of what is about to go down when it comes to the Hellfire Gala. This video is going to include Immortal X-Men issues number 11 and 12. Of course, we're going to have all the one-shots from before the fall. There's also going to be a little bit of Scarlet Witch. There's also going to be a little bit of X-Men Red. But this is just to set us up and see where everything is going to be leading us. That way, if you haven't been keeping up with every single launch, this video alone will be more than enough to have you fully understanding what to expect when it comes to the gala. So make sure you guys have subscribed to the channel, make sure that you like this video, and with that being said, let's dive into this breakdown. So a lot of theories are going to quickly be thrown out the window. If you had listened to our conversation with Blurred Without Fear, me and him definitely threw some ideas back and forth on what we think might happen. There were so many questions left unanswered, but Immortal X-Men issue number 11 is giving us everything that we need to know. And so our story starts us off with Storm and Rasputin 4. With Storm being the region of Arako, she had left everything to the Quiet Council. The only thing she asked of them is to make this work. Obviously, that all went sideways, telling Doug that it is time to begin. This is when they bring up the first one from the pit. They bring up Charles Xavier. Now, if you remember, everybody was thrown down into the pit. At least our four members that had to be resurrected, that we believe have the sinister gene in them. Rasputin is here because she is the one to keep them under control, psychically and physically restrained. While Charles is just asking what is going on, they tell him that they will explain later bringing up the rest one by one. We have Hope, we have Exodus, and we have Emma Frost all coming back from the pit. And so their time in the pit didn't last very long. Storm has been working with great effort, hand in hand with Forge, to try and figure out a way to get the Quiet Council back to its regular numbers. And Charles is the first one to say, is all this really necessary? Now, Rasputin 4, she has seen the future. She has lived through it. In her eyes, all of these guys have the great potential of being evil. So when Xavier is trying to ask if this is all necessary, that they have voluntarily thrown themselves into the pit, which he does mention is not pleasant down there, but he doesn't go into any more detail. They say that the four of them have done everything to help secure Krakoa's future. And Storm says that yes, you have, but only when it's too late. Taking all of them to Forge and hooking them up to the system. They had their every science brain go in on this. Double checked all of the genetic database. They had found nothing. But then they went back. They worked out the whole routine. And that is when they found it. You see, Sinister had created a sub-dimensional loop in the DNA sample. It coils into another dimension. It is almost totally invisible. There is one base pair stitched together. That is the only sign that he has been messing around. But in there, there is a whole other genome. One that is toxic, just waiting to attack. But he does believe that they can remove the loop. That the genetics are lost in time and space. But all the genomes should be all back to normal. And now that Sinister has been wiped from their system, Storm says that you guys aren't just jumping back into business as usual. Forge goes on to explain that he thinks he removed it. If he got it all, he is unsure. If it will come back, he doesn't know. They did miss it before, so who knows what other tricks Sinister has left in them. And so Storm is taking every precaution. Xavier is removed from resurrection duties. Hope's work will continue at a reduced rate, but anybody that she brings back will go through Forge's cleansing process and then they will be under heavy psychic surveillance because the risk of that person being compromised is still out there. When it comes to voting rights on the Quiet Council, until they can find a way to truly be sure, 
None of them have the right to vote. The problem that Xavier sees with this is that they are being asked to prove a negative. That they can never truly be sure if they wipe Sinister from them. This is when she tells them that there is something that they need to see. Mother Righteous has provided a detailed historical record of that timeline. Of the sins of Sinister. Rasputin providing psychic access to make sure all of this is on the up and up. And Storm has noticed that Rasputin has a certain self-righteousness to her. This does concern her, because while Rasputin may be a true believer in Krakoa, we have all seen the path that that can lead down. And so the Quiet Council is going to sit down and they are going to watch this. Now they could telepathically implant all of these memories, all of these visions into their mind. But Storm wants to do it the old-fashioned way. She doesn't want this to be over quickly. She wants this to linger. She wants them to have time to think. By the time that they have finished this, Hope cannot even look at Exodus without being absolutely disgusted. Xavier recognizing the severity of the situation. All he tells Storm is to tell us what you need. And so the way Storm sees it, they cannot be seen publicly dismissing four members of the Quiet Council. It would look like chaos, but they also can't go without their input. The vast knowledge between those four alone, it is an insight that is a necessity to Krakoa. And so Rasputin is going to be the personal security at all times. She will stand by the side of Xavier. She will ensure that he never steps out of line. When Charles asks what's been going on in their absence, with Destiny, with the Moiras, all of it, that's when they go to the Quiet Council Chamber, and sitting there waiting is Destiny. Storm and Charles, they have some questions, because Destiny has known about the Moira engine. Destiny says that it was too much of a risk. She didn't know where the engines were. She was too worried that Sinister would restart the timeline. But Storm also saw everything from that timeline. Irene had tricked Storm, tricked her into stealing the Moira engines. Even further, Destiny knew how to deactivate the X-Gene. The same she did with the real Moira. The question now remains, why did you not deactivate it when you had the chance? Now for the readers, we already know this. She wants to keep Mystique as long as she can. Alive, healthy, for as long as she can live. She kept the sinister timeline going. She did all of this for the love of her life. But this is not information that she is willing to divulge to either Storm or Charles. And while she goes on to say that there was an indestructible shell around the Moira labs, that there were failsafe after failsafe, and this is the reason she didn't do anything, but she did give them the option, the opportunity, to be able to take it back later on. But Storm knows that something is being hidden from her. She doesn't know what it is. Storm wants to know why this timeline was kept running for as long as it was. But Destiny says that this meeting is over. That's when Charles tells Storm that they have to go. Because right now, Hope and Exodus are going toe to toe. With Hope calling Exodus a Judas, Storm says that she's gonna go stop them. But Destiny can't hide the truth forever. This is where we pick up with Mystique. Mystique in a room, she is running into Mother Righteous. Mother Righteous believing that she was coming to her in the shadows. Mystique grabs hold of her and puts a knife up to her throat, asking what she wants. Mother Righteous has just come to deliver a message. The message that Irene had created for Sinister in the Sinister Timeline. This is Mother Righteous just planting those little seeds of doubt, of mistrust. It appears that her goal is divide and conquer. As we pick back up with Hope and Exodus, Storm comes in trying to separate the two. She comes in with a strike that could shatter a mountain. But against these powerful individuals, it is almost like throwing water in their face. This is because Hope is feeling betrayed after seeing that timeline. Seeing what Exodus had done to her, 
Storm breaking them up saying that it has been hard for all of Krakoa, but you both need to understand how much you mean to everybody. The leader of the five and her shield, who stood defiant on Judgment Day, with mutant kind currently looking up at you two battling in the sky. Do you really want them to see this? And so the two of them coming back down to the ground. This is when Hope says, do you know what an Omega level power manipulator means? It's not memory banks. It's not range or the accessories. Hope was killed in that timeline by Exodus leaving her behind. Omega means there are no limits to what she can do manipulating powers. This is where she takes the powers from Exodus. And the fight continues on the ground. Hope is just laying down the hate on Exodus. She beats the living crap out of him. Telling him that your god gives and your god takes away. To stay away from her, that she is not his messiah, that he is not a church. Walking away, she apologizes to Storm, saying that there are simply no words. This is where Storm has to head back to Arako. Logos waiting for her by the gateway, having a quick conversation with both Charles and Emma. With Charles walking away, Emma and Storm have a conversation. Now everybody is taking all of this pretty hard, except for Emma. The thing is, Emma, she, she's already done the supervillain thing. She is very used to shame, but she also understands that they weren't themselves. Sinister had unlocked the worst part of them, and she knows better than anybody that they aren't their worst selves, no, how, no matter how much anybody thinks of that. Her time in the Hellfire Club had taught her all of this. But Storm also says it's not just what happened then, it's what you did now. That future was brought on because of the present day games that you guys are playing. And Emma, she kind of pauses and says that this is a bit hypocritical. You said no thrones on Arako, yet you end up being worshipped like some King Arthur. And to even further this, there is something that has been missed that was a key point in this awful future. Yes, Storm was a hero. Congratulations, pat yourself on the back. But Storm was herself for every single second of that future. And it took her five years until she realized something was wrong. Five years of being the region of Arako. While down on Krakoa, they were drowning. And so she asked Storm, what did you do? You did nothing until it was too late. She tells Storm that you're on the Quiet Council for a reason, and with their votes gone, they need Storm more than ever. But still now, she is about to pop off and head over to Mars. As the two of them take off, we pick up with Sebastian Shaw and Mother Righteous. Mother Righteous saying that Sebastian had played his part well. The two of them have a budding business relationship going. He didn't want to blow it up by revealing that the new friend of Krakoa was also the money behind Celine's power play. And Sebastian would like to develop this relationship even further. He knows that this place is tipping. It is about to all go south. Krakoa is rich. If it does go down, he wants it all. He wants to own Krakoa. This is when he asks if she is able to arrange that. She says that she can, but she wants something a little more practical than a simple thank you. To use his position on the Quiet Council to proposition certain motions. And while he says that these motions will never pass, even with four votes gone, she tells him to why not take the opportunity and see what you can do. This is what takes us to days later. Storm has arrived back to the Quiet Council, and while Emma's words definitely ticked her off, she knows that it is true. And so she has come to the Quiet Council chambers to meet up with one of the members. She fears the situation between Charles and herself is deteriorating. She has become aware of a certain truth. She has responsibilities on two worlds, but she cannot be in two places at once. She also doesn't want to step down from either of these duties. There will inevitably be council business that she cannot attend to, and so she needs someone on the Quiet Council, someone to speak for her. If an emergency situation demands it, she wants this individual to be the proxy and vote appropriately. This is when it is revealed the person she is talking to is none other than Colossus. Alright gang, so as we dive into this issue, 
everything that we had seen going on in Legion of X is still continuing. Nightcrawler has been captured. But more than that, we are seeing the mutation growing and being even bigger across the globe. People are being murdered. We see that Banshee is back, but he no longer has the spirit of variance. That's going to be explained as we get further along in this comic. But the big news right now is Nimrod standing atop Legion. With Legion being defeated by Nimrod, Legion says to run it again. As Banshee and a couple of the others watch this ongoing, this isn't a literal fight between Nimrod and Legion. This is a dream circuit. This is a simulation. They know that Orcus is on the horizon. Somehow, they are turning mutants into monsters at random. This is only furthering the propaganda against all mutants. And right now, Orcus has some of their people. They've got Nightcrawler. But before they go after them, Legion has to know that he can take down Nimrod. But every time they run this simulation, Legion loses. Ruth is using her powers of possibility, testing David to his absolute limits for every single outcome. And the reason that Legion keeps on losing is because Nimrod is faster. He adapts quicker. But Legion isn't stopping. He keeps running this simulation after simulation after simulation. He is also still a little bit weak after his father's visit. The psychic virus that had been planted in him, Legion is still repairing from it. And so, as they take a break, this is when they call over to Banshee, asking where is his ghost? Now, Banshee woke up and he had no memory of what has been going on. He has no memory of being Vox Ignis. And Banshee's reality, it seems to be all buggered up that Banshee was broken in a trillion parallel universes. He was a shell of a man, but someone had helped him, bonded him to a higher power, gave him the strength to go on. But somebody has taken all of that away, and Banshee has no memory of any of this. Legion believes that this has something to do with the timeline alteration, and so Legion being permitted by Sean, he goes into the mind of Banshee, and what he sees is Mother Righteous. This is an invitation. As we are taken to the astral plane, they come upon a doorway. Ruth leading both Banshee and Legion to this door. They have come to have some words with Mother Righteous. And Mother Righteous knows where Dr. Nemesis is, knows where the Black Knight, knows where Nightcrawler is. She says finding them isn't necessarily the hard part. The hard part would be getting them out. This is when she asks, do you put your faith in me? And Banshee would like to understand why Mother Righteous's face is in his brain. Ruth would also like to know why she alone remembers an averted timeline, showing the books on the shelf saying that this was a gift from herself, that it took a lot of magic, but she has all this information, including Mr. Banshee's sooty soulmate, the spirit of variance, saying that it wasn't much more than fuel in the end, drained in essence and memory from every thread. This is when Mother Righteous shows something to Legion, shows their encounter during the Sins of Sinister event. This is enough to bait him in, asking what happened to him after that. She says that he went to the stars, he ascended to some higher plane of existence, and all that power, all that alienation, she expects that he could do that right now if he wanted to. And so she makes a deal with them. She can take care of Nimrod. In fact, she has already done it in that future timeline. She knows just the trick to take him down. And in return, the only thing that she asks for is a little gratitude. With Legion being more than willing to just simply say thank you, he says thank you, and they get to work. That is what takes us to the Bloom, the secure Orcus facility up in space. With the assault detected, Nimrod becomes activated, and Nimrod is telling Legion that you have run the simulations, that you may be able to field an infinite variety of powers, but you are limited by the speed of your body, because you are nothing more than a meat puppet, that he is unable to adapt as swiftly as Nimrod does, so he is outclassed. But Legion hasn't come here to fight. He even confirms that that is true. Legion has come to share some stories. That is where Mother Righteous appears and she grabs one of these golden orbs and shoves it into Nimrod's brain. She shows him everything. 
While Legion makes his way through the ranks on this ship, he goes to rescue the Fallen, the Stolen, and Mother Righteous, she is showing Nimrod exactly what happens. That there is a soul in him. That soul is linked to Warlock. Mother Righteous is telling Nimrod that he is more than a mind. That she has seen him fall. In another future in a dead timeline, she has watched as he was crushed. All of his brilliance, all of his savage intellect, his speed, his strength, none of it means anything because they will do anything for each other. That is their story. That you will never be greater without your Queen of Hearts to guide you. With Nimrod activating a full retreat, Mother Righteous says that they will speak again. As Legion and the others get ready to make their escape, this is where Nightcrawler's mother comes up and she cuts off the head of Legion, catching them completely by surprise. All of them are jettisoned into space. And while she thinks that she has taken over, while she thinks that she has her Nightcrawler and taken down Legion, Mother Righteous comes into play. With her telling Mother Righteous that this was never part of the plan, we see the life force begin to get sucked out of her from Mother Righteous. Mother Righteous gave her the power she needed to climb out of this, to master the art to achieve everything she has so far. All she ever did was say thank you to Mother Righteous, but she put her faith into Mother Righteous. A little gratitude is all that it takes. No matter how mighty that person might get, they will always owe it to Mother Righteous. And Mother Righteous is the worm that is eating away at the heart. As we see one of her golden orbs begin to absorb, with her being taken down, we see Legion and the others were saved by a bubble. Legion holding his own head in his hand. They make their way to the Savage Land. Because Mother Righteous says that she knows how to get rid of this monstrosity, this mutation that is affecting all of our mutants. She is coming to break the spell. With Dr. Nemesis just going off. Yelling, screaming, telling Mother Righteous that she is no good, that her magic is just absolutely ridiculous. Mother Righteous cuts her down, using the soul sword that is the soul, the spark of Nightcrawler. But they quickly bring Dr. Nemesis back to life, his mutation now completely gone. It is fair to say that this has worked out greatly, but now Legion wants to give that sword back to Nightcrawler, and Mother Righteous says no saying that she has grown rather fond of it. Now, Legion knew that something like this was going to happen. It was inevitable for her to try and double-cross them. He goes on to say that he thanked her. They did the deal, no hard feelings. Now, let's get Kurt back to the best of who he is. Legion doesn't want to fight Mother Righteous, but Nightcrawler needs that sword. This is where Mother Righteous begins to smile, because like Legion said, Legion thanked her. And that was his mistake. This is when one of her one of her orbs begin to absorb the life force of Legion. The sword, the sorceress, the machines, the mutants, all of it is nothing. Nothing compared to Legion. Telling David that he is falling in mind, body, and spirit. For all the power that he has, there is nothing he can do. Mother Righteous was let into his heart. He cannot escape the pool that is coming from within inside of him. This is when he says that he can ascend, like he does in that future vision. But this is when she shows him the rest of it. Yes, Legion did ascend. He went to a higher plane of existence. But what he didn't know is that there was something else there. When Legion ascended with everybody else, they were swallowed up by a Dominion. They were swallowed up by a Sinister. This is where she goes all supervillain and really reveals her plans, saying that she can't let the other Sinisters beat her, that David is the key, his power, the infinite recesses of his mind. David is the guarantee that she becomes the Dominion. This is when David tells her that he knows. This puts Mother Righteous at pause. This is when David goes on to explain that you may have gotten your teeth in me, but you better believe that I also went into your mind. I rummaged around. I know everything that you know. And while this doesn't necessarily change anything, he is reaching out to Ruth asking if the evacuation of the altar has been completed. The only one remaining is Ruth and him. And from Mother Righteous' psyche, they got a little of everything. They understand the power, the possibilities, the catalysts, the dominion, the fall of mutant kind, the wall crawler. 
Ruth is telling Legion that he did the right thing, bargaining with her. Kurt is the key. They need to save him no matter what the cost. This is when Banshee and the others come after Mother Righteous. This was all a trap as Legion grabs hold of that sword that is the spark. He throws it over to Kurt. We see him grab hold of that sword, cutting all the golden orbs away from Mother Righteous, and he is able to get that sword right up to her throat. While she put out a huge burst of energy, she is no longer able to sense David. She doesn't know where Legion is, not sure how this is possible or what is going on. Mother Righteous is left here alone with Charles Xavier later on telling Kurt that they don't really know what happened in the Savage Lands. But it appears that David has vanished. The altar was emptied out, and now the temple gate goes nowhere. Cerebro senses nothing. Professor X not wanting to lose his son again. There's not much that anybody can do. But taking us to a little bit later, we have Kurt that is meeting up with Cyclops. As they look over Krakoa, at this point Nightcrawler has heard about the murders. The Prime Ministers, the Chancellors, the two Royal Heirs. All from nations that rejected Krakoan friendship. All of them were ripped apart by a blue-furred mutant. And while this may be propaganda, he knows that he can't stick around. He knows that he is unable to stay. The two of them going and looking at a painting that was done by Weaponless Zen. He lets Scott know that he is leaving Krakoa. That they are going to come for him, one way or another. And he doesn't want to jeopardize the lives of the rest of the mutants. He has tried so hard to navigate this dream with joy and hope. While Cyclops tries to let him know that he can stay, he tells Cyclops that Storm will have his vote on the council until a replacement is chosen, to tell everybody that he loves them, that he will return when he is needed again, to tell them that he carries their hope in his heart. Alright gang, so as we dive into this issue, I highly recommend that you make sure you stay all the way to the end of this comic, because there is such a huge reveal at the end, one that we are going to discuss in great detail, because this has huge ramifications. But currently, we have the Scarlet Witch and we have Darcy. They are currently rebuilding the Emporium, and while they rebuild this, we see that Wanda's shoulder, it is still bleeding. It is bleeding from that mysterious rock, the one with the anti-magic properties. And while a healing charm could easily mend these wounds in seconds, Darcy wants to help her out. She wants to feel useful in some way, shape, or form. This is the only way she knows how to thank Wanda for everything that she has been doing for her. But while they do this, they hear screaming from the outside. As Wanda rushes outside, she sees that Cynthia is out there. She is in a helicopter and she is taking this helicopter straight down into the Emporium. With Wanda not having any time to be gentle, we see the helicopter explode. Wanda controlling the blast and Scythia comes out. The two of them begin their brawl. Wanda trying to let her know that I gave you the chance and Wanda hits her with a giant blast of energy. This magic coming down, but it does almost no damage because of the armor that she is wearing. That's when Wanda starts to take a beat down, taking all the punches, blood coming out of her mouth, letting Wanda know that this new armor is going to bring her down to her knees. And in the midst of the fighting, Wanda really wants to know where did you find so much of that ore? And while Wanda's magic may not be able to touch her, Wanda still has two weapons that she can use. She pulls up her fists, the fists of an Avenger, trained by the best, and now she is ready to lay a beat down. As these two go blow for blow, as they just lay down the hate on one another. The whole time, Wanda is trying to let her know that you have been doing this all because of tradition. The group of individuals that you are defending in the name of tradition you don't even agree with them. You are doing this for the sake of doing it because of centuries of just tradition. But Wanda tells her that you are the leader. You have the choice right here, right now. While Wanda is definitely getting her butt kicked, a blade is pulled out that was crafted by this ore specifically to take down the Scarlet Witch, telling her all you have to do is give up Darcy, and if you do not, you will die. 
with Wanda not willing to accept this as a choice. That blade is driven into the stomach of Wanda, and as she tells Wanda goodbye, believing that this is her last breath, Wanda goes on to say that if death is the path we are taken, then you are going to come with me. Because with all this armor on you, your chin is still wide open. Wanda was giving her the chance, hoping that she wouldn't be pushed to this point. But if Wanda has to choose between their lives and Darcy's, Wanda is more than willing to give up her life and take Scythia's. But she tells her that there is still time, that you don't have to die for your duty that you can live for your people. Asking Wanda what she would suggest, Wanda is saying healing. This is when Wanda goes to heal herself and Cynthia at the same time. You know, Wanda could have done this at any moment. She could have mended herself at any time. She may not be able to penetrate that rock, but it doesn't mean she couldn't heal her wounds. She needed Scythia to believe that the stakes were real. She needed her to understand the point that she was going to go to, what she was willing to do. But now she is letting her know that you are the leader. You have been the leader. And though you have centuries of tradition, you have the option to change tradition. So gather your people, convene a coven of mothers, and do what needs to be done. Going on to say that if they want to change, it will be their decision alone. That she has much to consider. Leaving behind this low mysterium, she tells Wanda that they are no longer enemies. That she needs this armor no longer. And if they are to do battle again, she wants to give Wanda a fair shot. And so she'll start from scratch again. With her leaving Lot Kill, we see Darcy come out and give a huge hug to Wanda. As they fix all the destruction. As they go on to explore this low mysterium. As they try to understand this rock where it came from. Darcy says that she is going to stand by her side and they are going to get the answers as they begin to investigate this rock. But taking us outside of Lot Kill, we have a couple of frat boys that have wandered drunkenly into a cave. The same cave where this low mysterium came from. But as they go inside, they find themselves attacked. Almost like ninja stars created out of the beer cans. These boys getting severely wounded, they run for their lives. Believing that this place is haunted. The truth is, this is not a haunting. Alright gang, so as we dive into this issue, we are picking up with an actual date night. As we pick up on the shoreline of Araco, what now is referred to as Planet Araco. We are picking up with Craig Marshall. And this guy, he's a NASA astronaut. He has a doctorate in astrophysics and another in soil and crop sciences. And this may be the most ordinary man that Storm has ever gone on a date with. This is where we see the stunning, the beautiful, the talented, the Omega level mutant Storm coming down in her absolutely beautiful dress. Her and Craig are about to have their first date. And so the two of them begin to talk. They begin discussing everything that he has been through. Everything that led him to Araco. You see, during Uranos' attack, he had saved some mutant children. He was willing to give up his life for them. Willing to do this without a second thought. And while this was a completely selfish act, this caught the attention of Storm. Thinking that maybe this man is notable enough to be able to go out on a date with. But everything that he has learned from Morocco came from Commander Brand. Brand currently on the run. Nobody knows where she went. If she does surface again, Mutant Kind is going to bring a hammer down on top of her. But he's beginning to learn that this world, it has so much to offer. But Craig has also been a fan of the X-Men long before the era of Krakoa. When Krakoa was founded, he was really hoping that this would shine some good light on the X-Men. Everything that they have done for the world. But in the middle of this conversation, we have Charles Xavier who interrupts. He is telling Storm that they need to cut this meeting short. That he needs her to join him on Krakoa at once. Because they need to talk about Magneto. 
Storm very reluctant to do so, she apologizes to Craig, saying that they will have to catch up more on the second date. This is what takes us to Southern Araco Prime. We have Nova, we have Kobak, and we have DaCosta. Enjoying the warm waters of Araco. The three, they sit and they discuss. Nova finding it very hard to just relax in general. He knows that there is so much going on out there. He knows that Araco has been targeted by some heavy hitters, but his therapist insisted that if he didn't take at least six hours off each and every week, then his therapist would quit on him. So here he is hot tubbing while the galaxy burns, or at least that is how Nova sees it. But as this conversation continues on, we have Kobak who says that he must leave them. You see, Kobak, he has a battle in the Circle Perilous. This is the final conflict for the Seat of Victory. With Arako's council being slim in numbers, they are now working to fill those spots back up. And Kobak has no plans to yield. This means that he is either going to win and he is going to earn his place on the Great Ring of Arako, or he will be dead. The only thing he asks of them is that if I do not return, please remember me. As he makes his exit, Nova does ask how many seats are left open, and there is only a couple of seats left. Under the Law of Logos, there are preliminary events before Battle in the Circle, tests of fitness for the role. The new Seat of Dreams is at the stage, but the Seat of Stalemate was decided yesterday. It appears that the seat had been filled by Lycan, and DaCosta compares him to an Omega level Wolverine. Then imagine an Omega level Wolverine and then double it. But while they have this discussion, that is when a giant beam comes down. It is the external gate that comes from other worlds. And with this giant beam going up into the sky, it only means one thing. There is something coming through and it is something big. DaCosta telling everybody it is time to suit up they get ready for whatever is about to fall upon them. This is what picks us up with Charles and Storm. With Charles apologizing for interrupting what he thought was an important meeting. And at this point, Storm has become very irritated with Charles. The man he has become. Almost a whimpering dictator of sorts. And even more to this day, Storm resents him for what he did all those years ago. When he had first recruited Storm, he told her that she was living in a fantasy. At the time, she was young enough to believe this. To believe that people she was saving, they were worth less than helping Charles. But Charles does wonder, was he wrong? Because in that time, how many times have the X-Men saved the world? Saved the universe. All because Storm was there. And while it does make sense, the greatest good for the greatest number. Life as mathematics. But there is no mathematician deciding who plays the remainder in their cold equations. This is when they get on the conversation of Eric. With Storm reminding him that he now goes by Max. He went back to his birth name. For Charles, this is a little difficult, because Eric was his oldest friend. He knew him as well as he knew himself. But what he didn't know, who he didn't know, was Max. Magneto never let him meet him, and that is why Storm is here today. There is something that Charles needs to know. When Magneto died, Charles was currently engaged in psychic warfare on a scale that nobody could imagine. He did feel the death of Magneto. And at the time, he believed that he didn't have the time for the fine details. Or at least this is what he told himself. The truth is, he flinched. He couldn't look at it. He didn't have the strength. But now he is asking Storm. With him now being the sole captain of the ship of state. And everything going on with Sinister. How he infected him with his psyche. He needs to know what were Magneto's last words. And Storm says that those were private. They are not for her to discuss with anybody. And while he says that those are private for me, Storm says, most of all, they are private from you. You are going on this whole tangent about being the sole captain, like a king on the throne, as if the Quiet Council are merely just there for you to summon. This is when Charles starts to go a little bit off the hinge, because now he understands that Max did say something. Not sure if he saw Sinister in him when he left the council or not. And while Storm tries to calm him down, 
trying to say that she understands how he feels. While he tries to give orders. While he tries to say that he could take those thoughts from her mind right here, right now without asking. We see him go off the hinge. Storm lets him know that she is no longer an X-Men. She is no longer led by Charles. While she does respect his grief, she has to ask in what capacity do you think you can order me around? With Charles saying that he could simply just read her mind if he wanted to. She says go ahead, why don't you try? And when Charles goes to read her mind, this is where he is shot back. She repelled the psychic probe. And Charles is the one that taught her how to do this. Taught all of them how to do this. It is called the Red Triangle. A psychic defense protocol. One to be called upon if they ever face a telepath with evil intentions. Or one who has lost control. And so she has to ask, what has happened to you? And right now, Charles is afraid. After everything that Sinister had done, seeing that timeline, seeing them manipulated, after the Council Massacre, he cannot be sure if Sinister still has a grip or not. And Resurrection being based on his genetic database. His evil is the foundation of their greatest good. If their Eden has a serpent, it wears a diamond, or a spade, or a club, or a heart. Either way, they are surrounded by enemies within and without. Moira had lost her faith turned against them. Magneto lost his and turned away. Charles fears that if he loses his faith, this nation will not survive. And Charles can't help but feel guilty for all of the timelines that Sinister has birthed and destroyed. All of the secrets that have been kept from him. If he would just peered into the mind, pried a little bit into the mind of Sinister, he may have been able to discover all of this and stop it all. But he also understands this is how Sinister had used his power to violate private thoughts to control. But then Charles thinks back to all the times that he has crossed this line himself. Just now, he did it in an attempt of anger. So now he is questioning everything. Is he sinister? Is this him? What is the difference between the two of them? This is when Storm goes on to say that Magneto was thinking of you when he died. He asked Storm to watch him. Not because he thought he might be sinister, because Charles is Charles. Of the three who shared the dream of Krakoa, Charles is the last. And rather than allowing his dream to pass on to other hands, he is trying to bear this weight alone and it is crushing him. And while Storm would like to think that a measure of concern lay at the root of Magneto's request, Magneto was Charles' friend. But after today, Storm is not. This is when she tells him, don't take the gate to Arako ever again. And this is what takes us to the external gate of Arako. With Nova and DaCosta standing by, Nova does a scan and whatever is coming through is real bad. Something is cutting through space, carving a path between realities. As it begins to flare up, they prepare, with a huge blast sending them backwards. A person standing there after it all clears, asking if they are of Arako, but what they see puts them at pause. The man carrying a sword. The white sword has fallen. 99 of his champions were with him. This is the last 100th champion. He brings the legendary weapon Purity as proof of his last words. What the White Sword had said is to tell them, to tell them all, that Genesis is coming. Alright gang, I said this one's gonna be awesome and I'm telling you, man is this so freaking good. Now our story starts us off in Ameth. We are picking up prior to John Ironfire taking off to Arako. We are picking up at the Castle of the White Sword and his 100 warriors. As he sits upon his throne, he lets it be known that Genesis is coming. But Genesis isn't coming like she did before. Now White Sword and his 100, they have taken down Genesis before. On multiple occasions. They have fought back demon hordes. They have taken down great armies. But now Genesis comes with something more. She comes with the Staff of Annihilation. A gift from Saturnine. And in the hands of Genesis, this curse has come for them all. And White Sword knows that this battle is already lost. There is no winning against Genesis this time. There is simply standing their ground and fighting. 
we see that he is talking to John Ironfire. John Ironfire was the first to fall and the first to rise. Of the 100 warriors that are at the back of the White Sword, Ironfire was the first, the oldest friend to White Sword, being by his side for a millennia. John Ironfire has died countless times for the White Sword, but today, White Sword is asking him to live, to survive. White Sword is handing over purity. He is telling Ironfire that you must bring this sword to Arako. You must tell them, especially the Seed of Loss. Let them know what is coming for them. This is when we see him release John from his obligation. His mutant ability being able to more or less possess individuals into service, making them have undying loyalty. And as John Ironfire wakes up from this, he says that it felt like a dream, but it doesn't change the fact that the two of them have been friends long before being in service to him. He has kept Ironfire alive for as long as he possibly could, but he lets him know that there is no more coming back. White Sword is no longer able to heal him and resurrect him. That if you die this time, you die for good. That's when a guard comes running in and lets them know that Genesis is no longer coming. Genesis and her army, they are at the door. As we see these forces moving in, we see the 100. They waste no time, they begin to open fire. And this is where we see the Children of Apocalypse, with Pestilence shooting an arrow. This arrow lands in a mutant by the name of Taurus. With it landing in his shoulder, we see that this is spreading quickly, because this is Plague Weapons. It slowly begins to take him over, and this spreads by touch, which means anybody that he now touches is also with the plague. And while some would want the White Sword to come out and free them of this plague, others say that this is a bad idea, that White Sword must stay hidden, he must stay protected. But White Sword makes his entrance onto the battlefield anyway. He refuses to let his troops suffer in agony for his own comfort. This is where we see him walk up to Taurus and he is able to free him of this plague. With the wave of his hand, this plague is wiped from all the ranks. And this is where we have Genesis riding in on a freaking dragon, wielding the Staff of Annihilation. She has come for the White Sword. She has come for purity. But the White Sword, he has a question of his own. He wants to know, where is Apocalypse? And while she gives no answer, she only repeats her question, where is the sword purity? Telling him that if you were to hold it high, even now with all the power that she has in her grip, White Sword may have stood a chance. But he knows that that's not a thing that's gonna happen. The truth is, they may have been able to hold them at bay, to hide away in their castle. But White Sword is no coward. He will face them on the battlefield. That he would never stoop to the tactics that Genesis is doing. Sneaking up on him, trying to take everything. And while Genesis, she notes this insult, there is nothing to stop them now. With White Sword not having purity, this battle was over before it even began. That's when she rises up the staff that the time has come for them to acknowledge Genesis's rule, that Arako calls, and Genesis will no longer take no for an answer. And so, with the staff whispering, the White Sword and his 100, they kneel, much like the possession that the White Sword himself does. The staff takes absolute control of them. They cannot deny the power. They cannot fight against it. When the staff was waved, they became imprisoned into this army. This is why this time is different. Genesis has a weapon that is so powerful, not even the White Sword can fight its effects. And so White Sword and his 100, now under the control of Genesis, all except for one. The one that White Sword loved the best. The one that he trusted the most. With his life. With his soul. With his sword. That's what picks us up in present day. At the Red Lagoon in Araco. We have John Ironfire talking to DaCosta, talking to the Brotherhood, and talking to the Night Seats. We have Storm, Korra, Nova, DaCosta, and the Fisher King. They are all discussing what to do next. But this decision, 
It is too great for one person to make that they must take this to the great ring. They must plan against this threat and decide what their response is going to be. This is where John Ironfire gets a little bit upset because he believes that they need to act and they need to do it now. That they must gather the troops and they must be prepared to fight. And Korra does agree with him that if they face annihilation in whatever form, time is of the essence. This is what takes us to Arako Prime, on the grounds where Uranos had did so much damage to so many mutants. We see a gateway pop up, but this isn't a Krakoan gateway. This is an Okara gate. She goes on to say that the secrets of this gate are hers to keep. As she looks upon Arako, she sees the blasted plane, barely alive and marked with the bones of their dead because Genesis wasn't there to prevent it. And Genesis is talking to Mariana Stern of Coven Akaba. Now Stern, she wants war. In her eyes, they are both getting what they want in this situation. Now Genesis goes on to say that you're, you're a little bit naive. That you think you want war with Arako. You think that this is going to help you out. But you have now lit a flame that may consume this world. And you are foolish if you believe that this flame will not spread. But Stern goes on to say that Coven Akaba speaks for Orcus. And they are counting on the spread. Alright guys, so as we dive into this issue, I gotta say, man, X-Men, they are the freaking lines that just keep on giving. Ewing has beautifully wrote this comic. The way that Apocalypse is betrayed, hands down, is some of the best writing that I have seen in recent years. It really helps you understand who he is, who he has become, and who he is going to be. And so our story starts us off in Ameth, with Apocalypse meditating. A young demon coming before him, and this young demon, it wants to know what is strength. Referring to him as Apocalypse, he goes on to say that this name is a corrupted name, one that has been mangled by history. At one time, this name did please him. His name had once meant the final destruction, but in his mind, the time for such blunt concepts that is really ended. The name that he goes by today, a more ancient word with the meaning of revelation. For he is the revelator, and he always has been. But when it comes to the meaning of strength, if the strong survive, then the measure of strength is survival. But survival has no moral component. Heroes die, brave hearts break, paradise is lost. Consider a rock that is battered by a million years of ocean. It may be worn down, but it is still whole. Does this make the rock noble? Can a rock be moral? Nonetheless, the rock is there, as was Apocalypse. This is the revelation as it was revealed to Apocalypse. It is not enough to only be there. It is not enough to only be strong. In mid-conversation, this is when the demon has been struck down done so by the hands of Genesis. Immediately, what he sees is that the family sword has been reforged, and Genesis is the one to carry it. Genesis coming and answering the question of what is strength. In her eyes, strength is surrendering to her, as it always has been. And while Apocalypse's heart knows this, a world is not a lover's heart, and he cannot support the course that she is going down. He cannot walk by his wife's side. Genesis has no intention of trying to force him to do so. She knows that he is the mage of mercy. But what she demands of him is to open the way. An apocalypse is not one to be forced into doing anything. Telling her that her armies, these will not persuade him nor the white sword in his hundred, nor his children, nor anything that she holds in her possession. One of those things being the Annihilation Staff. And so, taking one half of that sword, she throws it to Apocalypse. The two of them will duel, but they will also debate, each of them trying to persuade them to their cause, whether it be to stop all of this, or to continue on and press for war. Neither of them will hold back, by the end of this duel, either Genesis or Apocalypse will win. Before the fight gets underway, we are taken a long time ago. Back in the early days of Okara, Iska the Unbeaten bringing the family sword, a gift for Apocalypse. 
forged by a sword maker whose mother had created the white sword. Apocalypse says that this is an item, an ornament of exquisite beauty. And that's all a sword is in peacetime. It is an ornament, something to be placed on the mantle, something to be looked at, but not to be used. And Iska the Unbeaten is bringing this sword the day that his children are being born. Apocalypse, a man that has always seeked peace. He has always wanted peace and prosperity for his people. And right now, they are living in a time of peace and prosperity. And while he may be hopeful for the future, his wife Genesis knows the truth. With her children being born, she knows that peace is not the natural condition, that mutant kind itself, they are living weapons. They are made for battle. The question is not about if peace will always be. It is about when war will come. It is inevitable. You cannot stop it. This is something that Genesis knows all too well. But they name their children famine, war, pestilence, and death. As the children begin to grow, Apocalypse says that he's not too fond of their names. Now, he does like the names, but his children are monuments that are built from love, not that of pain, and each name for a concept lost to the past. The way that he sees it, they feed the land and the land feeds them. So he has to ask, where is the famine? Their healers love and play among their people. Where is the pestilence? Their swords are forged in celebration. So where is the war? Where is the death? Genesis reminding him that it's not in the past, that all of this is waiting in the future. It is waiting to strike. At night, Genesis would dream of a sword, one not made for bright days, but to herald in the night. She dreamed of splitting paradise in two, opening the door to annihilation. She dreamed that this was more than a dream, and so she named her children, not in denial, but recognizing what is yet to come what they must face, and what they must overcome. As we see the two clash together, they talk about the endless single moment when the Twilight Sword had cleaved the land in two. Neither of them will forget the scream, but it was not one in fear, nor a howl in pain. It was a scream of rage and despair, rage that paradise had been sundered, despair that would always be so. That Apocalypse had been forcibly awoken from his beautiful dream. The dream of peace. That scream. That was the burning of his soul. And he took that raw flame in his hands. And he gifted it to their enemies. And with much loss, they won. And so their enemy came to them. Begging with bow in hand. They wanted a parlay. They wanted to make an offer. But this offer they must earn. With the Annihilation Helm still on one of these people, we see Genesis jump into action, and Apocalypse recalls every single moment of this. He recalls the Annihilation Helm making its offer to Genesis and Genesis alone, but they were never told what it offered, nor Genesis' answer. She had kept this to herself. Genesis believing that the knowledge might have broke Apocalypse, and at the time she needed him whole. But now she believes that maybe it is time for him to learn. The Annihilation Helm had offered to seal the rift. And the only thing she has to do is ask. Not even requiring a please. All Genesis had to do was ask for the rift to be closed. The war would end right here and right now. No further losses, but no further wins. And Genesis truly only having one question. If the war does not end, if the rift remains open, can you win? And this breaks Apocalypse's heart. They had peace. The dream was real. It was in their hands, paid for with blood. They had peace, and Genesis denied it. Still believing she was right to do so because they were not made for peace. This is where we see Genesis drive that sword into the chest of Apocalypse. Genesis knows that they were made for war, saying that Apocalypse insults himself by pretending anything else. That he is a Verraco, just as she is. And in the broken land, they fight. And Apocalypse would have fought as well. 
He agrees that he would have for their fights, for their justice. Even knowing he would lose, he would have fought. Even knowing the cost. But the truth is, what is the cost? Now everything that Apocalypse has done was to force growth, to force a necessary change. But Genesis saw the results. The results of Arako and Krakoa. This is what takes us to Ameth. Just recently, with the summoners being defeated, they kneel to Genesis and Annihilation. The summoners going on to say that perhaps the outcome would have been different had Tarn the Uncaring lived to see this day. This is the first time that they have gotten news that Tarn the Uncaring was taken out. They talk of the world of Arako, and the children of Apocalypse have to ask, did the mutants of Earth finally conquer Earth like we have conquered Ameth? But they took a different path. Apocalypse watched the Krakoans, his other children. He saw what they could do. Old death to new life. The children of Apocalypse not happy that he has been keeping secrets. Asking what now happens on this world of Arako. Would we approve of what has been going on? With Apocalypse pausing. He says that their people, they continue to be tested. This is where Mariana's stern comes into play. Astral projecting herself here, she comes to say that Apocalypse is a liar. That their people are not being tested. They have already been tested and they have failed. She shows what has happened. She shows them Uranus. And while Apocalypse tries to let it be known that this is Orcus, that these are old foes in new disguises, Genesis wants to hear this out, with Stern going on to say that it should be impossible to confront an Omega of Arako and survive. Yet Uranos did so, and so she did what was necessary. She gathered her children home. She took down the summoners. She took down the White Sword. She gathered her forces. She tells Apocalypse that she chose him long ago and she still does to this day. And while he may have been the living Apocalypse to the weak Krakowans, of the two of them, Apocalypse will always be the mage and she will always be the warrior. Asking if he yields, Apocalypse does, saying that she is correct but he is more than a mage, he is a mutant, and he comes armed, able to control every atom in his body, this is his gift, this is his mutant weapon, pulling those swords out of his body, he lays down his swords, as he did on the plains of Otherworld to save them all, he yields, but on his own terms. But this day, Apocalypse has been persuaded. If the reasons to act differ, that matters less than the necessity for action. Mutant kind will not survive the fire to come without Arako, and Arako must thus be tested. It must be tempered in the flame. A millennia of mutant magic contained in three seeds. The Okara Gates. One he gives to Genesis. One he will keep for himself. And the other he is to plant here in his own blood. Blood is what the seed must feed on. For mutant blood has always been the cost of mutant power. Genesis asking if he will come with her. He says that this is not a path he can go by. It is not a path he can take any more than it is a path she cannot deny. The only thing he does ask of her is to walk it alone. But she refuses this. Grabbing the Annihilation Staff, she says goodbye to her husband. As she walks through the gateway, Apocalypse has his own path to go. His own forces to gather. Their destinies will cross again on the battlefields of Arako, and his love will test him once more. To face the test is to face the revelation, and the revelation never ends. Alright gang, so we are picking up in the Arctic Sea. Maverick submarine has been sank to the bottom, and Beast Prime, right now he is letting everybody know that they must find that missing Wolverine. This is supposed to be a covert operation, weapons of X in everything that they do. This means they must remain in the shadows. A Wolverine left behind compromises their secrets, and so they decide that it is time to send out a recon. To scour for the sub, scour the ocean floor, see if they can recover this body. This is when Beast Prime tells one of the other beasts 
that they will be leading the charge, that they must lead from example, they, th they cannot see themselves as superior, that they must be doing the field operations as well. This is where we see that Maverick is tucking away the little prize that he stole, the Wolverine, the clone that they are all looking for. As Beast and the Wolverine clones, they deploy, they go down to the sub, and they investigate. And this is exactly what Maverick had wanted, because he honestly didn't want to tuck tail and run. He wanted a little bit of revenge. He paid a lot of money for that sub. A lot of money. And now he's gonna go collect on some debts that are owed. As the Wolverines and Beast make their way into the sub, they start looking around, completely submerged in water. They cannot hear the sounds around them. So as Maverick comes in and he starts taking out the Wolverines one by one, nobody is the wiser. As Beast, the clone Beast, is swimming around, he finds this Wolverine, what he believes is the missing one. As he grabs the Wolverine and prepares to swim out of here, he sees the explosive. Maverick already hightailing it away. That is when the sub detonates. All the clones inside the sub, they are absolutely decimated. This is what takes us over to the healing gardens of Krakoa. We have Jeff who is waking up to find that his daughter is alive and well. She is hanging out with Black Tom. But right now, Maddie is a little bit livid with him because Jeff lied to her. Jeff lied to her friend Logan, and she tells him that you don't have many friends. So the friends that you do have, you really need to be loyal to them. And Jeff knows that this is right. Wanting to fix things with Wolverine, he asks where Wolverine is. Black Tom letting him know that Wolverine is hunting. He has gone after Beast. Knowing that he can't let Wolverine do this alone, Maddie is going to stay with Black Tom while Jeff goes and he goes to take down Beast. As we jump over off the coast of Greenland, we have Maverick who is making it to his secret hideout, throwing this Wolverine into a jail cell. It doesn't take long for the real Wolverine to show up, and Maverick is asking what the heck is going on. As the two of them pop open a beer, he tells him that the short answer is that Beast has gone rogue. He's after everybody and anybody who has crossed Krakoa. That includes Maverick. That is why Maverick was Wolverine's first stop. And so Maverick goes on to inform him, to let him know exactly what he's got going on. Krakoan tech, a whole platoon of bad Wolverines and they can only assume that he has as many as he wants, taking the opportunity to let him know that this resurrection business was always going to come back and bite them in the butt. But Wolverine looking at the clone of himself, he sees that Beast hasn't quite mastered the formula. If he had, Maverick would be dead right now. These are nothing more than off-brand potato chip Wolverines. They're dumb, they're primal, they're savage. Wolverine understands this because he's been here. As he puts this Wolverine out of its misery, he's going to reach out to Sage, they are going to take this Wolverine and find any evidence that they may be able to link. But when it comes to Maverick and Wolverine, the two of them are now teaming up and they are planning to take down Beast. In the English Channel, we have the Clone Wolverines. They are hitting ships, anything that has Krakoan medicine, going to places that Beast thinks don't deserve it, that they will have no choice but to accept Krakoan sovereignty. Now back at Beast HQ, inside of his makeshift weapon, some of the other beasts, they have been getting together, they have been talking. They think that it is time for maybe some new leadership, that Beast Prime has taken things too far. They know any sign of mutiny, and Beast Prime would wipe them off the freaking map. But when Beast Prime calls a meeting, we see a bunch of Wolverines. They quickly surround the three beasts that are preparing this mutiny. And those Wolverines, they gut the beasts, saying to burn their body and process their replacements. Beast already knew that this was going to happen, that mutiny was inevitable but all he has to do is kill them, resurrect new ones. Taking us somewhere off the Northern Atlantic, we have Jeff who is heading the operation. After that last ship had been hit by Beast, they assume they know the area where Beast might be operating. And so, getting in helicopters and ships, they are getting ready to take him down. 
as the fighter jets, the helicopters, they're sending everything after Beast. This is when Command lets them know that they have targeted a hostile, saying that it looks like one of the Wolverine clones. They're not 100% sure, but they say that it is 100%. That they, in their mind, there is no doubt that this is a Wolverine clone. Now, we know this Wolverine and Maverick traveling together, we know for a fact that this is not a clone. But with them telling Jeff that they are 100% certain, Jeff gives the order to blow them out of the water. His life has been lost. That's where we pick up at a bar in Norway. As they try to figure out what the heck they're gonna do next, we see one of the Wolverine clones come through the front door, looking like he has a freaking bomb in his hand. Maverick wastes no time, he straight up wastes this Wolverine. He blows him to pieces, and Wolverine jumps on the bomb. But this was no bomb. This was a message. It is a hologram, and Beast is offering Wolverine an opportunity for them to sit down. A dinner invitation, and he knows that he is going to accept this. He knows that there will be no trickery, because Jeff didn't die. Beast found him, and now he is holding him captive. And so Wolverine now obligated to head out to this dinner invitation. We pick up with Beast and Wolverine. Wolverine definitely not happy to be here. The two of them sit down, as Beast is just gorging himself on lobster. Beast goes in to talk about how they have such a long history, that they have worked together and known each other for so very long. But he's laying this out as simply and clearly as he can. Beast's methods may be unconventional, even unsettling, but they are effective. He says that he is helping Krakoa. What he is telling Wolverine is that you leave me alone, and I will leave you alone. Now Wolverine goes on to try and tell Beast that he's not like this. But Beast goes on to say that this is who he has always been. Maybe the pressure of so-called civilized norms is the only thing keeping him in check. But once that restraint was released, the true spirit of a man or mutant is revealed to itself. Sometimes that spirit is unflattering. Sometimes it is raw. Sometimes it's brave and true, even if unpopular. That maybe, just maybe, this is who Beast has always been. With Wolverine's claws coming out, Beast lets him know that that's not why you're here, and you killing me will change absolutely nothing. All Beast is saying is that you leave me to my work, and I will leave you to yours. You know that I have Jeff, and so now he offers an exchange, because Wolverine has two of the Wolverine clones, with them being very difficult and very expensive to manufacture. He would like them back, and in return, Wolverine will get Jeff, saying that he will follow up with the time and coordinates for them to rendezvous. As we take off to Maverick's secret bunker, they discuss their options, they discuss their next move, and Maverick believes that he might have that move. You see, these two Wolverine clones, they're beginning to talk. This is something that they hadn't done prior, and so when Maverick ran a bunch of tests, Beast grew them to be dumb, to be primal, but the healing factor must have kicked in. Their neural network, they have quadrupled, which means these Wolverines, while they may be dumb, while they may be primal, that is slowly changing. And this means that Beast has surrounded himself with an arsenal. An arsenal that might turn on him at any moment. Alright gang, so as we dive into this issue, we are picking up directly where the last issue left off. We are picking up with Kid Omega. Though that name doesn't necessarily fit anymore. Because Kid Omega is an old man. When it comes to his exact age, we're gonna get to that in a little bit. But Quentin had come through a portal. He told all of X-Force that he needs their help and he needs it now. That they are all going to be doomed. And the way that Quentin is talking, we can tell that he has been on his own for quite some time. Seeming like an old man screaming at a wall. And right now, Sage and the rest of X-Force, they're truly trying to figure out what the heck is going on. With Quentin seeing that Deadpool is on the team, he is almost insulted that Deadpool is here, saying that you invited him on the team in the stead of Quentin. It seems like they're playing X-Force's greatest hits, with Deadpool going on and just talking smack. Quentin says that he's bored with him and sends him away. Just like that, Deadpool is off the table. That's when Omega Red charges in, with Quentin quickly putting him down as well. 
thinking to himself that things have really gone sideways ever since he left. But this team of X-Force, this is gonna have to do. At this point, Sage has no idea what is going on. She wants to know the where, the how, the what, the who. But Quentin tells him that the real question is when, saying that he will explain on the way. But right now, they gotta get going. As Omega Red stares into this portal, we see a giant tentacle grab hold of him, and it sucks him in. While this is happening, Quentin is going on to say that he should be gone already, not Omega Red. He is talking about Beast because that is exactly why he is here. With everybody watching Omega Red get sucked into the portal, trying to figure out what is happening, Quentin tells them that it's better he just shows them. And so everybody is sent into the portal. They pop out the other side, we have Colossus, we have Sage, we have Wolverine, and Domino. With Deadpool being left behind after they disappeared, as Quentin tells them to follow him and do it quickly but quietly, we see Colossus fall right down to the ground, and he's not really sure what's going on. Colossus feels like he just woke up from a dream, like he has been sleeping for a hundred years. And while Quentin tells him that this could be a side effect of time travel, they begin to carry him out of here and they hightail it. But what is really happening is that Colossus is no longer attached to his brother. While the Chronicler was writing all of this, guiding Colossus's moves, working him as a puppet, with our team time traveling, with Colossus disappearing into the future, the Chronicler lost him, which means the connection has been severed. Colossus seems to no longer be a spy. But as our team makes their way through this lost land, Wolverine begins to pick up the scent. She picks up the scent of what look like Beast. They are carrying Omega Red to where we don't know yet. But these versions of Beasts, they are vastly different than what we know today. That doesn't stop X-Force from going in, slicing and dicing, shooting away, just tearing these guys apart. But this also makes the sirens go off. Quentin lets them know that more of the Beast Priests will be coming. At this point, X-Force is trying to figure out what the heck is really going on here. As they make their way underground, being separated from Sage and Colossus just for a moment, they find them down here underground. This is what Quentin calls the Crew of the Rebellion, and we see a kind of futuristic version of Wolverine. But this is just the head of Wolverine. We don't know what exactly happened to him, but whatever it was, it wasn't good. And though he may be just ahead, have all this machinery attached to him, that is not stopping him from fighting. But Quentin had to show them this so that they would believe, so that they would understand. As Omega Red is being drug away to wherever he is going, Quentin goes on to let us know what exactly happened in this timeline. What we learn is that Beast has carefully cultivated fear over time. First, a fear of humans, and in this existence, they have been more or less wiped from existence itself in a global genocide. But then there was the fear of mutants who didn't support his per perverted theocracy. This has taken place over centuries. And then eons. Eventually, Beast becomes a god. He becomes god of all mutants. This is where we see a giant version of Beast, manipulated, twisted into a hideous monster. And this is where they were bringing Omega Red, the little minions of Beast, the Beast Priests. They were bringing him to Beast Prime. And we also get a quick informational page about Cerebrex, the former Cerebro Cradle. Now we saw when it became sentient, when it became corrupted, Cerebrex ultimately possessed Krakoa itself, rising up as a towering organic monster. Kid Omega had plunged into the heart of said monster, destroying it with a psionic blast. But in that explosive moment, Cerebrix and Kid Omega, they experienced convergence. Quentin had found himself a little bit rattled, a little bit entranced. He was an Omega-level mutant who had also felt like he belonged in the shadows of Jean Grey. At least for a long time, he felt this way. 
But with this sudden access to the timeline, he saw potential for true greatness. In the hands of an Omega, Cerebrix would be a tool. It would be a weapon. After witnessing a terrible glimpse into the future, he took himself out of the present to investigate further these threats that awaited mutant kind. And so the body and mind of Kid Omega thereafter had vanished from the present. All traces of him had been wiped away from the cradles. This was all done by Kid Omega. He did this because he did not wish to be replicated in his absence. In his eyes, there is only enough room for one Quentin Choir. But this is where we pick up as they get ready to make their assault. With Wolverine and X-Force saying that they're gonna finish up this battle for him. But at this point, there's not really much of a plan. The only plan is to kill Beast. But before they take off, Sage does take Quentin aside, and she wants to know exactly how old he is. Even Quentin doesn't know. He has been waging this time war for so long. He has lost track of what century it is. But all he knows is that it has been a very long time. And at this point, he's getting a little tired. This is why he went sodding after X-Force. He needed his team. He needed his friends. Not only that, but he has been quite alone for a long time. Though he has built up this rebellion, his heart has always been with X-Force. And with Wolverine asking Colossus how he's feeling, he is still feeling a little disoriented. He's not really sure what's going on, but he does have enough strength to do this fight. With Wolverine making the plan up, she jumps into the hand of Colossus, and now she is about to be catapulted directly into the lair of Beast, with her more than ready to kill her way home. The rest of the Rebellion, they charge in. The Beast Priest holding Sentry. The X-Force in the Rebellion, they quickly make work of these centuries. As they get ready to lay down the hate on this Beast Prime. As they enter the room, they see that it's already taken care of. And this wasn't by Wolverine. You see, this Beast God, he ate Omega Red. But Omega Red was not easily digested. Omega Red had killed Beast from the inside, ripped his way out of the stomach of Beast. In that instant, that quickly, the fight was over. And so the team thinks that there is only one thing left to do. That of course, is to leave. It's to go back home. But Quentin failed to explain himself in his entirety. He goes on to say that by saving the end times, by saving the end of things, they may have created a new beginning, but the old beginning, it still needs an ending. He had said before that this beast had become the god of all mutants, but there are others out there. The beast of the X-Force timeline, he has planted various versions of himself to influence the future. These experimental hatchlings and mutations are waiting. They observe, they scheme, and they emerge when the time is right. And so to ensure that Beast's plans have been completely taken out, they have to work their way back through the timeline, back to the beginning of the end. They have to root out his infection throughout this entire timeline. And while he can't tell them exactly what they will encounter, he can tell them that the worst has already happened. It is yet to come. We have Beast who is coming in and desecrating the graves of these pharaohs. He is doing so, that way he can have his own contingencies. Knowing that they will come for him, knowing the possibility of his death, he takes these clones and he plants them all over the world, hidden locations where nobody would look. From the Great Wall of China to the Colosseum of Rome, he knows that these monuments will stand the test of time that there will be no fast food restaurants, apartment complexes built over him. As he sets up all of his backup plans, this is what throws us over to the X-Force team. With us jumping 5,000 years, we see the time portal open up, the X-Force team fall in, and what we see is the flora looks almost identical to Krakoa. Because in this future, Krakoa is much more than an island. It is a world. And Kid Omega lets it be known that every single footstep that they take is registering within the larger Floric network. They are being felt, watched, heard, smelled, and tested by the living organisms that surround them. So it was only a matter of time before something came for them. That something is the Children of Beast. The Children of Beast being the floral itself. 
half mutant, half Krakoa. Because Beast had learned how to weaponize Krakoan biotech. He did this by splicing his mutant gene into it to create some kind of hybrid organism. And so the children of Beast, they attack. And while X-Force is able to hold them off, this is where we see giant jellyfish. They come in, they grab our heroes, they restrain them, and they fly them out of here. Now, they don't really know where they're going. That is, of course, until they start to see the signs. They are headed to Staten Island, one of the last pockets of humanity that is left alive, where Krakoa hasn't been able to take over. And they are greeted by none other than Deadpool. With Deadpool saying he has been waiting patiently to join up with the team again. Ever since Kid Omega had left him behind, he has been waiting for their arrival. These days, he's going by the name of Skull Dozer the Magnificent. Now, Deadpool goes on to explain that the jellyfish are kind of like his spy satellites. He's saying it's relatively self-explanatory, but it doesn't make much sense. He quickly moves on to the next subject of how he kept Staten Island this way. That is because they have been spraying herbicide daily. Though the people that are here with him, they find themselves in a rather tumorous situation. The herbicide has not been kind to the people left remaining, but it does keep Krakoa at bay. As Quentin goes on to say that he is officially taking command of this outpost, him and Daredevil begin to have a little bit of an argument. But this is when Quentin falls down. Something happens to him. His mind scrambled. Not really understanding what's going on, everybody rushes over to him. Everybody concerned that maybe he had a stroke. Now, Deadpool knows something that we do not. Quentin is keeping a secret. There is something fatally wrong with him. And while we have yet to fully uncover what that is, it's obvious Quentin is keeping this from X-Force for a reason. And when the X-Force team goes on to ask him what is wrong with Quentin, Deadpool tells them that he will tell them earlier. That he has yet to tell them, but he eventually will. But it's not going to be in the future. It will be in the past. With Wolverine just beating the crap out of him. Because to them, Deadpool right now is not making any sense. But that is the least of their concerns because the children of Beast have returned. Bursting out of the ground, they immediately go for Omega Red. Shooting some kind of acid, we see his skin melt right off of his bones. That's where Deadpool is telling Quentin that he's gotta get up. Deadpool missing half of his body. Quentin has no idea what just happened. But Deadpool is saying that you are currently in charge considering I'm missing half my body. He tells Kid Omega to fix this. And so Kid Omega riding a rocket, he heads directly for the moon. Now if you've noticed, the moon has looked relatively beast-like. Quentin knows that this is the source of their problems here. As he rides that rocket directly into that moon, we see the tremendous explosion, and all the children of Beast begin to fall apart. But with that destruction, Kid Omega is now missing again. They believe him to be dead. With Domino and Colossus having a conversation, Colossus is a little bit worried that they're being too haste. That maybe this isn't the real beast. Maybe they are chasing down Dark Beast. Asking if this had ever occurred to any of them. But the way Domino sees it, this doesn't excuse his behavior. In her eyes, he is a traitor no matter what. Colossus simply doesn't want to forget about the good that was inside of Beast. But as they have this discussion, we see Kid Omega come falling from the sky. As he falls down to Earth, something comes out of his mouth. We're not really sure what this is, but it's got to do something with his illness. As the rest of X-Force shows up, they did not see any of this go on. He tells them that he is fine, but it is now time for their final jump. Warning X-Force that he saved the worst for last. Alright gang, so as we dive into this issue, we are picking up with Dr. Stasis. Now, Dr. Stasis, every single day, he ends his day with his cloned wife and child. And every single day, he watches as they die. When supper is over, his family time comes to an end. But on this day, things go a little bit differently. Because today, Mother Righteous is here. At first, he refers to her as Rebecca. Rebecca Essex. But she lets it be known that you can refer to me as Mother Righteous. That she hasn't been Rebecca Essex 
devoted wife to Nathaniel for many lifetimes. But she is here to give information because she knows things that he does not. She knows that he is a complete fraud. He thought that he was the original Nathaniel, but they both know that he is not. Because how else would you be able to explain her existence? But she's not here to play games today. She is here to let him know that she is taking an interest, possibly a controlling one, in Orcus. Really, Mother Righteous is coming here to let Nathaniel know that if you get in my way, I will step on your throat. That she's creating boundaries. She tells him to not make a single attempt. Don't do anything with the future her. Also letting him know that there are to be no more clones of his wife and son. Really, this is just her putting dominance over Nathaniel. Letting Dr. Stasis know that he is not going to be the one to rise up out of the ashes. That Mother Righteous will be the one to reign supreme. Now, this is what takes us over to a building fire. Currently in New York City, we have New York's Bravest doing their best to put this fire out. As some of the firefighters get ready to be engulfed in flames, that is where the Stark Sentinel comes into play. The giant metal hand going right through the wall and rescuing these firefighters. With Fei Long having the successful takeover of Stark Unlimited, Orcus wasted no time in testing out its new creations. The rebrand seems to work for most Americans. But while this Stark Sentinel is out here rescuing all of these firefighters, one of the firefighters is a mutant. Detecting him as a mutant, it goes into a hostile mutant protocol enabling. It grabs hold of him, and it looks like this Stark Sentinel is about to straight up murder this firefighter in broad daylight. As it goes to crush him, that is where the X-Men come into play. They waste no time, they begin to go in on this monstrosity. With Forge trying to use his little ray gun to do something, he thought that this would melt the hide of this monstrosity only for it to do absolutely nothing, recognizing that they're gonna need a little more firepower. This is where they call in Gene, Sink, and Talon, telling Sink to be ready to use Polaris's powers. As Iceman tries to freeze this thing in place, we have Forge that is trying to use some coding, trying to break this thing down, and at first he thinks he might have it, but that's when the Stark Sentinel just straight slaps him out of the sky. With him going down, we have the arrival of Jean Grey, Magic, Sink, and Talon. They jump into the fight, and Sink immediately tries to crush this thing into a can. What they didn't know is that it has countermeasures to magnetism, and so crushing this thing like a soda can is not an option. With Sink being smashed like a freaking bug, bones broken, bleeding out all over the place. As he lays dying, he reaches out to Talon. Using her powers, he slowly begins to regenerate. Now later on, Orcus is going to say that this was mutant aggression. That they sent the Stark Sentinel to go and help people, and the mutants attacked it. But secretly, the Sentinel, it had been programmed to take out any kind of mutation. Programmed by the enemies of mutantdom to provoke the attack. They wanted to draw out the X-Men. They wanted them to do this fight. They wanted the world to see this. They wanted to draw first blood. This is where Jean Grey, she tells Magic to go ahead and end this. With Magic snapping her teleportation discs open and then closing them, we see this thing begin to break apart. Piece by piece, it is being teleported. It is being scattered across the universe. She does this until there is nothing but a head remaining. And that's when Jean Grey breaks this thing down till it's absolutely nothing. There will be nothing that they can retrieve from this. But the X-Men know that a single machine nearly took out the entire X-Men team. They know that they are going to have to step their game up. Because if there are more of these, they know that they are about to have their work cut out for them. Forge saying that he's going to have a conversation with Tony Stark to try to find any weakness that may be able to help take these Stark Sentinels down. Meanwhile, with Dr. Stasis and Nimrod with Fei Long, they are discussing the situation. Now, they had really hoped to bag themselves Marvel Girl. Unfortunately, they were unable to do so. 
that is because magic came and interfered. But nonetheless, their point was made. They made mutant kind look like the bad guys, while Orcus is the one to deal the first strike. They are spinning this like mutant kind attacked this while it was saving heroes. But when it comes to our Omega level mutants, Nimrod says that he can take care of them. That you guys focus on what you're doing and leave all of those pesky Omegas to Nimrod. This is what takes us to Krakoa, Emma Frost having a discussion with Wilson Fisk. And Wilson Fisk has been granted Krakoan citizenship. This is because of his marriage. That they will defend against any human world that may try to interfere. But if he slips into bad habits, the protection will be taken away. He says that he's going to be a good Krakoan citizen. With their business being concluded, this is where we see Cyclops meeting up with Emma Frost. And we are learning that Cyclops and Jean Grey, they're taking some time apart. At first, he believes this is why Emma had called him here. But the real reason that Emma is calling him here is because a tragedy has occurred. Before everybody finds out, Cyclops was close to Miss Marvel. And she is letting us know that Miss Marvel was killed in New York. Alright gang, so we are picking up in present day and we are picking up with Kid Cable. With him body sliding into this timeline, he has seen that there is a mutant massacre just on the horizon. But he plans on preventing the Hellfire Gala from ever happening. This is taking place 24 hours before the Gala is supposed to kick off. But he plans to stop Orcus tonight. Breaking into this facility, this is where he runs into Omega Sentinel and Moira X. He knows what they are planning, and he refuses to let it go down. Omega Sentinel letting him know that if he traveled back in time to prevent tomorrow, then it is proof that they have already won. This is where Nimrod comes down from the ceiling. He grabs hold of Cable, and he straight rips his freaking arm off. Before he can even think, before he can even move, Dr. Stasis has moved in and he froze Cable in place. They didn't want to kill him because killing him would only bring more from the Elsewin. They're gonna keep him on ice until all of their plans are completed. But now they must focus on Manifold. Moira X saying that she cares deeply about him because he is a problem and humanity loses if Manifold lives. So we don't know exactly what Manifold is going to be doing, what role he will be playing, but obviously, Manifold's role is instrumental to the success of Mutant Kind. This is where we pick up at the same exact moment, but we are picking up with Rogue and Destiny, with Destiny going on to say that Mutantum dies with Manifold. Now Rogue wants to tell the X-Men, but Destiny is saying that they simply can't do so. That if they are to take this to the X-Men, there is a turncoat that is on the X-Men. A great betrayal that will turn the tides. It must happen so that they may make this weakness a strength. The X-Men will buckle under the weight of the war to come. What she sees is kings clashing in white. Black after the death of the Red Queen. A bolt from the heavens. The stars ripped in half. The poisoning lies of the false captain, and the fool who speaks the truth will pay the price. And while Rogue has no idea what any of this means, it doesn't change the fact that she says it is enough that it is true. This is what picks us up on Game World. And right now, we have Pogger Pog who is just pillaging this place. Taking everybody's winnings, taking the purses, taking the gold. And it doesn't take long for the X-Men to show up. As our team make their moves, they are doing their best to try and calm Pog down. But we see his little Poglets looting and scooting just the same way that he is. That's where Magic jumps into the fight. During the fight, there is a break in the window. The glass shattering and Sink currently taking the form of Colossus' powers. He goes flying into space. But with the Colossus armored form on, he just needs a little help getting back inside. With Jean Grey plugging up the whole breach. We have Talon who is going in on Pog. Taking her claws and jamming it into the crocodile's mouth. The rest of the team, they all jump in at the same time. Magic screaming down the mouth of Pog. That's where we see the true Pog show his face. And Magic is here to make a deal. The necklace around her neck, the one made of Mysterium. 
she is willing to give this to Pog if he is willing to stop and go home. With the X-Men team dipping out, Magic taking Pog out of here, we pick up with a conversation between Jean and Cyclops. With them going deep into the mines, getting some true privacy, she goes on to tell Scott that she is so proud of what he has done, and he should be proud of everything he has done as well. From the treehouse to helping Forge, Cypher, and Krakoa. But she also goes on to say that she helped create an entire living planet. A planet that he has never stepped foot on. He has never been to Arako. And so the question is why? Now the way Scott sees it, if they give humans a reason to think that they don't belong on Earth, they will take it. While the creation of Arako was well intended, and it definitely solved some short term problems, he worries that this is an invitation to be exiled. And while she sees this as cynical, he tells her to look around. Have you seen humans recently? Do you not feel that we are already at war? And just one of those new sentinels had mopped the floor with them. Orca's propaganda and disformation fills the air. And if you look at how they treat their own kind, the ones who don't fit in, the ones that wear the wrong clothes, love the wrong person, those people's only crime is that they make their oppressors uncomfortable. He wants to be there for all of them, for mutants and for all mankind. But Jean believes that love is enough to win those hearts, that they can't pretend that they are the same as them, that he is a great captain of Krakoa, that it suits him and he is good at it. As she kisses him, she goes to fly off, going to check on their wounded friend, but she is sticking to her guns about leaving the X-Men that if he is not on the team after the gala, and he wants to come with her, all he has to do is come find her. That's where we pick up with Jean Grey checking in on Polaris, struggling with all of the loss, everything that has been going on. And while Jean Grey comforts her, we are picking up with Magic and Sunfire. Sunfire has been tasked by Arako to help find its voice, Red Root of the Forest. The member of the Great Ring has been trapped in Otherworld ever since Krakoa won the tournament that led to the transforming of Mars. Mad Jim knew what he had in the Iraqi mutants. The only question is what is the price that he paid for their return? And so Magic, she opens up a disc with Sunfire saying goodbye, saying that if he has not found his own way back in a week, then please meet him right back here. And he is sure that he will have freed Red Root by then. As Sunfire makes his way off into the distance, we are picking up months later. Sunfire looking a lot like freaking Craven the Hunter. In this darkness, with Red Root on his chest, he apologizes, saying how pathetic that a mutant by the name of Sunfire would be reduced to little more than a spark in the void, telling Red Root that he failed. He does not know how long he can march in this darkness, but soon he will fall. And when his heartbeat is finally at its last, his failure will be complete. Alright gang, so we are picking up in Milford, New Hampshire. A small town, a quiet town. Just a nice place to live. Except on this day, this town is about to get hit with a blast that is so heavy. The ramifications are going to be reverberating throughout the entire globe. When this town is hit with such a heavy blast, the world news organizations begin to go out and saying that this is the latest in mutant aggression. They are referring to this as a Krakoan dirty bomb, a mutant suicide attack. That's what takes us over to Krakoa at the Quiet Council. They are discussing what happened in Milford. Power out, comms are dead, food is spoiling. Disease is spreading, floods, emergency services being down. The situation is only getting worse at an accelerated rate. And now the Quiet Council, they must discuss what is to happen. And Bishop is letting them know that either a mutant did this, or at least it was made to look like a mutant did. Bishop would like to put out a field team and lead the response immediately, with everybody in the Quiet Council agreeing to do so. This is where we see x Corps thrown into action, being made up of Tempo, Angel, Penance, Jean Grey, Triage, Bishop, Storm, Cyclops, and Iceman. They are jumping into this. They are helping as many people as they possibly can. As they begin their disaster relief, we pick up at the Bloom in Earth's orbit. 
and we are getting the sit rep that this was all Orcus. Their custom X gene that they created. This devastation is accelerated by their chronokinetic plugin. But even with all of this, with everything that they have done, their predictive algorithms show that Krakoa can still solve this disaster. Probably within a day, maybe less. But they don't care that they're gonna be able to fix this. Because the damage has already been done. Now as we pick back up in Milford, we have Tempo that is examining the site. They confirm that this was a mutant, at the very center of all of this. And the attacker's bones are admitting temporal nudge, making days of disaster out of hours. She is able to cancel the nudge. Time begins to flow normally. But even so, the folks here, they are terrified. They are so scared. As Cerebra does an examination of the bones, she is letting us know that these are custom X-Gene, assembled very sloppily. This was never meant to last. It is degrading at a very quick rate. But as they do this, this is where we have the arrival of what is known as the Watchdogs. Citizen mercenary groups here to defend the town, to stop mutant aggression. As Jean Grey examines the situation, she lets it be known that they are here to guard the town. Storm is up in the clouds making sure that all of the air quality has been fixed. Our heroes are doing everything they can. Dealing with the watchdogs has to come second. As Tempo and Cerebra, they begin to examine these bones even further. They have come to the conclusion that this was all a setup. That this wasn't a mutant attack. This was just made to look like mutants did it. And Tempo lets all the people know that she understands their anger. But she plans to hunt down the truth. That they are gonna find who is responsible. And they will bring them down together. But while she tells this to everybody, our heroes are battling against the watchdogs. Doing their best to not, not try and hurt them. To try and make sure that they're not getting killed in this fight. But they're not making it easy for them. As Storm tries to talk to their leader, he has no intention of actually hearing her out. Telling her that she needs to stay still so he can run her down. With Storm blowing up the motorcycle, he says, I knew it. I knew you guys were gonna try and kill us. That you're only proving our point. This is when Jean takes them up to the sky. Every single one of them. Their gun's not working. She is trying to figure out what the heck is going on. But all of them truly believe that this was a mutant attack. They may be crazy. But if this is a false flag, they don't seem to be in on it. They seem to be used as pawns just like everybody else. As they send the watchdogs off, saying that they'll be chasing their tails for hours. We see that they are trying to win the hearts and minds. They are trying to help everybody. They're trying to do their best and Milford has come to the understanding that mutant kind is not the enemy, at least today. The mayor even goes on the news and says that this was not a mutant attack. The Kirkoan was the first here to offer aid. Kirkoan's X Corps has pledged ongoing relief. And so they do everything they can to help these people, to rebuild this town. They truly are trying to win the hearts and minds. But even with Milford on their side, the news media is not focusing on anything that the mayor said, nor the people. In fact, they get the watchdog's leader on the news, talking about how this was mutant kind, how the mutants are responsible. They have come to kill us all. Today was not a good day for mutant kind. Orcus seeds are beginning to sprout, no matter what Milford says. And picking back up with Traveler, the Milford recovery is complete. Their attack had no lasting impact. But they also say that Milford wasn't the target. But the way the Traveler sees it, this went exactly as planned. Because every news station is reporting mutant aggression. Every single one of them is blaming the mutants. Regardless if it was them or not, the narrative has gone out. The news is running with it. Mutant Kind is the enemy. Mutant Kind made the first strike. And now, Mutant Kind must fall. Alright gang, so as we dive into this issue, we are picking up at the Quiet Council. All the members that have been compromised, or at least they're theorized to possibly be compromised. They are being asked to leave. This is about to be a closed session. As Emma Frost, Xavier, and all the others, they make their exit. Sebastian Shaw immediately puts it up for a vote. This sinister seat has been left open for too long. 
he is now pushing to have that seat filled. Now at first, Kitty Pride thinks that this is Sebastian Shaw just playing at political games, which it really is at the end of the day. The problem is, she didn't think that Shaw would have the votes to go ahead and do this. But then there is Colossus. Now Colossus is under the control of a reality warper known as the Chronicler, with Colossus's brother being the one manipulating the entire situation. His obvious goal is the downfall of Krakoa, and so any move that Colossus makes, it seems like it's gonna be more in the interest of making Krakoa fall, of bringing it down to its knees. And he is probably the most dangerous individual right now, because with so much of the Quiet Council being compromised, Colossus has three votes. Storm is Nightcrawler's proxy. Colossus is Storm's proxy. With Storm not being here, that means Colossus gets three votes. Immediately, Kitty Pride is shocked. She is shocked that Pete would go down this route, that he would vote with Sebastian Shaw. But with four votes against three, they introduce the newest member to the Quiet Council. And that member is none other than Celine. At this point, Kitty Pride is absolutely losing it. And throughout this comic, we're getting the kind of narration from the Chronicler. While Colossus is under control, it seems he, he understands what's happening to him. But he is unable to let anybody know. At this point, Colossus is hoping that somebody catches on. This somebody realizes he is acting out of character. That this is not him. That there is something wrong with him. But with Selene making her arrival to the Quiet Council, Selene was thought to be dead. But Mutant Kind is not the only people with resurrection possibilities. Because magic can be a very powerful thing. As they have this conversation, this is where Destiny speaks up. At first, she simply says no, and then she goes on to say that Shaw is working with Orcus. Obviously, Shaw refutes these claims, that he would happily go to a psychic search to confirm the facts. This is where Mystique calls in Rasputin 4. Without any hesitation, she goes into the mind of Shaw. Examining him, she learns that he has no relation with Orcus. This confuses Destiny, because this is something she saw. This is something that she she has seen. When Rasputin 4 says that she could scan her mind to see if this vision is correct, Destiny immediately says no. Absolutely not. That is not happening. Now, Kitty Pride at this point, she's looking at Colossus and she's asking, what the hell? How far does this coup go? Now, at first glance, Kitty Pride sees this as Colossus selling them out for an extra vote, ensuring that Kurt's vote will always go to Colossus at least until he returns or there is some kind of replacement chosen. But Colossus goes on to say that he has sold no one out, that the council has become corrupt, that he became the liaison for X-Force to prevent any kind of further abuse of power. The way that he sees it, the good are gone, and only the sinners remain. The Quiet Council is heavy with secrets, and so now he is moving to release the full details of the Sinister Timeline to the world. While he makes this proposal in the green room, we have Hope, Exodus, Xavier, and Emma. Now, at first, Hope is wondering why nobody is even trying to check in on the situation, but they don't want to breach any trust. They believe that they did only make the situation much worse, but Hope, she cannot help herself. As she peeks in on the situation, she sees what's going on and she immediately heads toward the Quiet Council. Standing directly in her way is none other than Rasputin 4. This is where we also see Mother Righteous. Just recently, she had been banished, but she has made her return. And so while she manipulates the situation as well, we see Rasputin 4 go and attack Hope. While Emma Frost, she is doing an examination of Hope's mind. Kinda a way around the rules, not breaching anybody's trust, just seeing what Hope is up to. And Emma has learned that Selene is back, that they have voted her onto the council. Now at this point, Emma is about ready to put Colossus to sleep, but that is where Xavier stops her. He says that even now, we cannot do this. With Hope reaching out to Exodus, saying that if you want to make things up to me, if you want to make it right, come and help me with Rasputin 4. But he says that he cannot stop this. And if he cannot, then who can? 
At this point, Kitty Pride is recognizing that they are fighting outside, but Colossus is letting it be known that they must continue, while Kitty argues that this is something that you cannot spring onto the council, that there must be debate. This is where we have a small delay, because we have the arrival of Storm. At this point, Colossus is no longer able to fight back against the Rider. He has been trying with all of his power to fight against this reality warper, hoping that someone might realize how broken he has become, how corrupted and compromised he is. And Storm is asking, what the heck are you doing? He is moving that they break while they consider their options, to calm down and return to debate this. He believes his position is just, and he is happy to convince anybody that that is true. And so as they take this break, this is what picks us up with Mystique and Destiny. Now Mystique feels a little bit foolish. Destiny said she had a vision. Mystique wanted to prove that this vision was true. She didn't know that Destiny was lying. Either it was a lie, or just Destiny didn't actually know. The problem is, when the Moira engine had been destroyed, all the futures were reborn. Now it is much bigger, a whole new map, and she only knows the old map. She is yet to gain the larger perspective of what is yet to come. This is all new territory, and right now, Destiny is terrified. She is more blind than she has ever been before. She is scared, she is in a weakened state. This is when Destiny sees that Mystique is going to kill her. Now Mystique lets it be known that she would never do that, but she does want her to listen to something. This is where Mystique plays the recording from the Sinister Timeline, the one where Destiny is saying that she would do absolutely anything to ensure that Mystique stays alive. And when Mystique died in the Sinister Timeline, she was ready to burn down the entire universe. But Mystique goes on to say that this is simple. Our love may be immortal, but we are not. You must accept that at some point in time, you are going to lose me. That I will die. As the two of them embrace one another, we have Mother Righteous manipulating things from the outside, casting her spell, we see that Mystique does turn on Destiny, her arm manifesting into a sword. We see that sword going right through the stomach of Destiny. Destiny beginning to bleed out and then she eventually dies. As we pick up later at the Arbor, Destiny is being resurrected and Mystique is saying that she doesn't know what overcame her. Suddenly she was filled with anger and then she killed Destiny. Sebastian Shaw is also here just to let them know that hope is compromised. Anybody that she resurrects is also compromised. This means that Destiny's vote no longer counts. And so with four votes for, three votes against, and five unable to vote, it has been decided that the world is going to know of the sins of Krakoa. When Storm goes on to ask Colossus why, he simply says that you trusted me, but I don't trust you. That it would be arrogant to assume that I was going to agree with you in all things. Colossus using all the willpower that he has. He lets Storm know that I am not your playing piece. Or at least it looks like he's speaking to Storm. But really, could he be speaking to the reality warper? Trapped inside of his own mind, Colossus prays for any kind of deliverance. He wishes that Storm could see past all of this, to see the awful truth, that he is trapped in a Russian novel, tormented by his brother, and his escape is impossible, with Storm walking off saying that they will live with what he has done today, and she can only hope that he is right. Alright gang, so our story starts us off in London 1852. We have Rebecca and we have Nathaniel Essex, the two of them taking a stroll down London. As the two of them sit here and discuss the gods, pagan and Christian alike, Nathaniel goes on to tell a story about a wife and a husband, one that live an unimaginable life. Because on this day, this is the day that he proposed, pulling out a ring asking if they can build a family together, asking Rebecca to always be by his side. And Rebecca accepts. With the ring going on her finger, she says that her heart will always belong to him. And that's what takes us to London in present day. Dr. Stasis is finding himself very nervous. 
because this day, Mother Righteous is coming for a dinner date. And as the elevator doors open up, that is where Mother Righteous shows up. Now, Mother Righteous doesn't know that this is going to be a date. She thought that this was a meeting, with Mother Righteous starting this conversation off talking about Orcus. Dr. Stasis letting it be known that Nimrod is doubly suspicious of the actions she has been doing, especially that she has become very popular on the island of Krakoa. There is even rumors that she could be on the X-Men team. Her popularity has become so great that during the Hellfire Gala when they vote in their new X-Men team, her name could be thrown into the pot. But Mother Righteous has no want nor need to join the X-Men. She simply wants a working relationship. Now from this meeting, Dr. Stasis wants two things. The first thing we don't really get to see, a piece of paper that she burns after reading. And the second thing he wants is a date. The two of them to sit down and have a nice dinner. And at first, Mother Righteous is telling him that she is not Rebecca. Not really. And he is not Nathaniel Essex. Not in the way that he is trying to see it. Telling him that this is a road he doesn't want to go down. This story does nothing good for anybody involved. But Dr. Stasis truly does believe that she could love him again. And so, with Mother Righteous twirling her finger, we see her in her evening attire. As the two of them sit down, Dr. Stasis tries to have some small talk. This conversation quickly becomes how is taking over the world. And for Mother Righteous, it's going so-so. For Dr. Stasis, it's going a little bit better with Orcus on the rise. But even Mother Righteous sees Orcus more like a side game. She knows that he is more ambitious than to go with Orcus, that he wants more than this. With Mother Righteous asking how the last century has gone for Dr. Stasis, we get a glimpse through his life, a couple panels showing the last hundred years. And Dr. Stasis, he has been busy. For Mother Righteous, she has been just as busy. The two of them have both been working in the background, manipulating, doing anything they can to be able to grab at more power. But Mother Righteous goes on to ask, when did you realize that there were other Sinisters? Now, Mother Righteous had seen Mr. Sinister when he was playing around in public with the X-Men. At first, it had given her a fright. But Dr. Stasis, he knew Sinister a lot longer. They had moved in similar circles. In the 1940s, he was working for the US government. And while Dr. Stasis did some investigation, he thought that this was a creation of Apocalypse, a revenant left over from the process that had birthed him. But Dr. Stasis stayed clear, tried to put it to the back of his mind. For Mother Righteous, it has only been a decade since she discovered Sinister, surprised that it took her so long. But she does say that she was onto Orbis on a way earlier scale. And Stasis has no idea who Orbis is. This is him learning for the first time that there is a fourth. The two of them beginning to compare notes. Talking on how they met. Him a noble, her being courted. Together they had a child by the name of Adam. But he was unwell. Stasis grew obsessed. Working hard to save him but in this he lost himself and Adam died. She was pregnant again, but Orbis was never the same. She lost the child and died cursing his name. The pain was so much for Stasis that he turned to Apocalypse, transformed him into something that didn't feel grief. He became the monster, that he was Prometheus stealing fires from the mutant gods, and he had plans to burn them all down. When he was reborn, he knew what he had to do, the awful mistakes he had to make amends for. But Mother Righteous goes on to let him know that this is a false memory. He may believe it completely, but it's not the real deal. That that is nothing more than a fairy tale. And what she believes to be true is also not correct. That it is simply a story, but she knows what is happening. Pulling up one of her orbs, she pulls out a small book. A present for Dr. Stasis. As Stasis begins to read, he learns that Sinister, we already know, is confined to the pit. The other three, they continue to do what they are doing. While Orbis played his long game, Mother Righteous and Dr. Stasis were acting openly, and Stasis was planning something which would eventually lead to the fall. 
a lot of information has been redacted. So we're only getting small bits and pieces of what this is actually reading. But in the sinister timeline, Mother Righteous had learned the truth. That they were all created by the original Nathaniel Essex. He did this when he was dying after the apocalypse implants were rebelling. And so he created four versions of himself. All to explore the four alternatives. Mr. Sinister would explore Essex Man. Orbis, the cosmic powers. Mother Righteous, the power of magic. And Stasis, the possibility of post-humanity. And they were all pawns, all moving across the board in an attempt to become the ultimate queen first. One of them would become a dominion outside of time and space. In fact, one of them already has. And as the timeline had revealed, it wasn't Mr. Sinister. But who did? That has been redacted. With Stasis asking, what do I owe you for all of this information? She wants a simple thank you. But what he says is that everything he does is in thanks to her. Everything is for her. She is everything. This is when they find themselves returning to the Millberry house. They have come to pay their respects. Now Stasis had smashed the gravestones, but we see him bringing them back. Recreating it, it says Adam, Rebecca, and Morgan Essex. With him apologizing for Morgan, Adam, and everything else in between. She says that everything changes. The story continues to go on and on. That Nathaniel Essex, he wasn't a poetic man. As he had died, he tried to make the woman he loved, the one that he had lost. In a way, her creation is a love song. But now as they have gotten all of this out of the way, it is time for the other thing he had asked for. Grabbing one of her orbs, she sends it up into the air. Stasis had asked for the moon, and now she is bringing it. As we see a gateway open up, this is where the boatman Karen arrives. As Stasis jumps into action, Mother Righteous and Stasis fighting against the boatman, with his mask being smashed. He uses a weapon that he didn't want to use. Now he's tried to replicate the process behind Captain America's shield, and like every other scientist, he has failed. But he did manage to get it at about 99.9% .9 as he takes a ball out of his coat. He throws it at Karen and it lands into the chest, activating the Pym particles. We see this ball expand and the boatman is absolutely destroyed. As the two of them get close and it looks like they're about to kiss. This is where we have Celine. This is how she returned. Though she says she would have made her own way back eventually. She does thank them for the work that they have just done. And this has made Mother Righteous a confirmed Orcus affiliate. This is where we pick up later. Picking up with Dr. Stasis having another meeting. But this meeting, it is with Orbis, the Spade Sinister. You see, the thing is, Dr. Stasis already knew about him. In fact, the two of them are working together. They are working together against Mother Righteous. And Dr. Stasis has no intention of actually falling in love with Mother Righteous. The entire thing was a big game, a big scheme. Now, he does go on to say that he does care for her. But he doesn't care for her in the way that he was betraying. He wants her under his control. She swore an oath to him so long ago, and he intends to remind her. Because she promised to love, to honor, and most of all, she promised to obey. Alright gang, so as we dive into this issue, we are picking up with a mysterious individual, never showing his face. But if I were to make an educated guess, I would say that this is strife. It's either that or it's Major Chip Hazard from Small Soldiers. Death to the Gorgonites and all that good stuff. But we have this mysterious individual that is sneaking his way into the treehouse. He is doing this at the exact time that the Hellfire Gala of 2023 is kicking off. While this individual sneaks around in the shadows, that's where destiny comes into play. In the midst of the festivities, she recognizes that something is wrong. A soldier returned to the field of battle, and now this has complicated matters much more than before. Asking where Rogue is, Mystique says that she flew off at Mach 3 just a couple minutes ago. And so Destiny grabbing Mystique saying that they have to leave and they have to leave now. That there is no time to wait for Rogue, 
that she will find them eventually. She will find them when the time is right. As we pick up with this soldier, this mysterious individual breaking into everything, this soldier has found his way to the suit of Captain Krakoa. Now you guys know this suit because Cyclops had wore it. When he was perceived dead by the world, he had to hide his identity. And so, he became Captain Krakoa. But ever since Mutant Resurrection was told to the world, Cyclops no longer having to hide the fact that he is alive. The Captain Krakoa suit, it has been put to the side. But today, this soldier comes here with a syringe filled from Orcus. Not sure what this does or what it is supposed to do. He takes that syringe and he puts it into the suit. And this is where our boy Cyclops shows up. Letting this guy know to stop whatever it is he's doing now before he has to kick his butt. This soldier wastes no time going in on Cyclops. Cyclops. The two of them beginning to battle, with Cyclops asking who this guy is, his face seeming to always stay in the shadows. He says that he is just a man. With Cyclops hitting this guy with the beam, telling him to stay down, he calls up Forge and says that the treehouse looks like it's been poisoned. The place is falling apart. While doing this, the individual, he hits Cyclops in the face. He smashes him down to the ground, and he steals the Captain Krakoa suit. Throwing this suit on while Cyclops is unconscious, he heads off to Washington DC. Dragging Cyclops outside, he throws him over the ledge. And that is when this new Captain Krakoa, he heads off to DC. And right now in Washington DC, they are having a kind of committee meeting. They are discussing the future of the world, the future of Krakoa. Because Krakoa has become a superpower. Just a small group of mutants were able to terraform Mars. They have become the most powerful nation on the planet. And now they believe it is time to do something about it. That if they are allowed to continue, the United States will be knocked off its pedestal. They want to align themselves with Orcus. The anti-mutant rhetoric continuing on, this is where we have Captain Krakoa that comes into the room. We see Captain Krakoa, he takes two grenades and he throws it into the building. Now for us, we know that this is all a setup. Somebody is trying to make it seem like Krakoa is attacking the US government. This will undoubtedly start a war. Meanwhile, in Brooklyn, New York, we have Captain America riding his motorcycle around, doing what Cap does best, but then he sees that his bike is off balance. In a few seconds, there is a giant explosion. With Captain America having to bail off the bike, he is on a bridge, so he jumps into the water. Once he lands in the water, he finds agents of Orcus, all of them ready to take him down. Now, Steve Rogers has been America's best soldier across the better part of two centuries. His success is mostly skill, a little bit of science, and good timing and luck. But everybody's luck runs out as the Orcus agents begin to attack him. They begin to stab him. It looks like this could be the end of Captain America, but that's when something pulls him to the surface. That something is Rogue. Just recently syncing with Polaris's powers, she is able to bring him up to the surface. She also brings up all of the Orcus agents, hoping to have the opportunity to interrogate them. We see that they are also suicide bombers. With Rogue throwing them back in the water as quickly as possible, they detonate themselves. And now Rogue and Captain America, they are fully beginning to understand the gravity of the situation. A terrorist attack in Washington DC, Orcus agents trying to assassinate Captain America. Captain America knows that they are going to need help because all of them are in a lot of trouble. This is what takes us outside of Emily Preston's house, a young mutant living inside. We have the Iron Man freaking Sentinels that have shown up. It looks like Orcus is preparing to round up mutants. And they are not asking. They are doing this by force. This story will be continued in Uncanny Avengers number 1, The Hunt for Captain Krakoa. This is what picks us up with our second story. A very quick one by Jonathan Hickman. We will see more of this in the future. 
but this is the story that is titled Gods. We have Doctor Strange saying that he's simply too old for all of this, often worrying about the evil in this world and its ability to corrupt. But more than that, he fears the effects of this endless war between good and evil, the part that they play in it. Now, Steven has been one to always fight for the light, for causes better than him and for fate. And the man that he is talking to is Wynn asking if he is good or evil, and he simply says, Steven, my boy, who can even tell the difference anymore? And that will be the end of this issue. So let me know what you guys think down in the comments. So when it comes to Jonathan Hickman's gods, we're only getting a small glimpse of what is yet to come. But whatever is happening, it is huge. We can only assume that this has to do something with everything going on with Krakoa. We are seeing mutant kind ascend into godhood, as we saw with this little sneak peek of Uncanny Avengers issue number one. Even though they have their own mutant nation, even though they have an entire planet, that doesn't change the bigotry that surrounds mutant kind. Humanity is terrified. They fear what they don't understand. They fear what they cannot control. And mutant kind has far surpassed humanity. This is more than enough for them to think they need to do something about it. And while the UK has already made its moves, Orcus is now out here operating almost out in the open completely. At one point in time, they really tried to play it off like they're here to help everybody. But their anti-mutant rhetoric has continued on, and more people are biting. Even the US government has really had conversations on taking down the, the nation of Krakoa as a whole. After this most recent attack by Captain Krakoa, which I believe to be strife, but there's a possibility that it could be anybody. This is only going to escalate the situation. All-out war with Krakoa seems inevitable. Lucky for Krakoa, they have Captain America and the Avengers on their side. But is that going to be enough to stop the world governments from taking down the mutant nation of Krakoa? Let me know your thoughts. Let me know your theories. If you would like to get completely caught up on everything going on with this series, be sure to check out the link in my description as well as the top of this video. It will get you completely caught up on everything going on with this story. If you would like to support the channel, you can always do so by joining the channel membership. Much like Patreon, having multiple different tiers. From $1 to $50. From loyalty badges to comics every single month. Not only does this help out the channel tremendously, but it also gives you tons of perks in the process. If you are unable to do this, do me a favor, subscribe to the channel, like this video, hit that notification bell, and with that being said, until the next breakdown.